I just want to welcome everybody and thank you for staying um, on this beautiful day. Um, but I want to just talk for a minute that and share with you that Deb showed us lots of examples of different AAC writing samples. But if you're unclear, if your nonverbal student is working at an access level or an entry level, this is something that you might consider. It's not about the response format. Eye gaze, use of manipulatives or PECs or an AAC device doesn't automatically assume or mean that the student is at access. So this is what you need to consider. Is your student using their system to ex express their original thoughts? Or are all of the student's expressions limited to structured exchanges predicated on limited pecs or pictures that you're providing? Um, if they can navigate across multiple pages, certainly that student's working at access level. And you also want to consider how reliable the student is using their communication system. So for students at an access level with very early emerging communication skills, typically um, intentionality is implied, but is not really a reliable indicator for the student's voice. Now, what do I mean by that? So if a student's using PEX pictures, and when you're asking them to um, choose their favorite food pick, um, food uh, picture, and there's an equal chance that they'll pick the Doritos or the broccoli, but when they pick the broccoli picture and then they throw the broccoli on the floor after you give it to them and they fuss, you know that they really were not um, assigning meaning to those PEX pictures. And that student's most likely going to be creating an access portfolio. So how the students are using their communication system really is going to um, de determine whether or not you're going to score them at an access level or at an entry level. Because we know, though, that for some kids with practice and teaching using those communication systems, they can use their AAC devices or low-tech systems to tell you exactly what they're thinking. And so those kids will be scored at an entry level and you'll create an entry level portfolio for them. So let's um, take a look at this. Today, we're talking about writing to communicate. So students at a pre-symbolic communication level participate in the creation of written products. And for students working on an access skills, the writing sample must be tangible. Yikes. How does this work? Well, let's get started. When I was first tasked with writing, uh, creating a writing writing sample for my students that, that use a pre-symbolic communication, I was beyond frustrated. I mean, you might've heard me screaming from Falmouth because mm -hmm. I failed to see what the purpose was of creating a written product for a student who not only couldn't write, but who at best had a barely emerging communication system. But I have come to see that creating a tangible product or documenting my students' expressive communication responses in that context of that permanent written product has allowed me to revisit communication exchanges with my students over time and space. What do I mean when I say revisit communication across time and space? Deb, show us the next slide, please. Typically, a communication exchange with my students is fleeting. So they eye gaze or they grasp an icon or they activate a voice output device in the moment and then that moment is gone. But consider this for a minute. At school, we were practicing grasping tactile objects representing key ideas when we were listening to stories about the farm. And then later, we brought those tactile objects when we went uh, on a farm field trips. So when I offered my student the feather representing the hen or the piece of wool we were using to identify the sheep and ask what the student wanted to see, I would note his choice and his independence. And by capturing those responses and writing it down, I have a permanent writing sample. And the writing sample could be something as simple as this. So you see on the on the trip, they wanted to see and they 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 were just too distracted and made no response. And then when I when they wanted to listen to, they might have responded the sheep and they wanted to smell the sheep and that that wool thing had a great attraction, it seems, on that day. And uh, they actually picked the miniature tractor, too. So by capturing this, I can see exactly what the student did. And, but writing it down and I took this back to school, we could revisit this conversation at a different, a different space, at a different time. So you can see how that could be helpful. 
so why are we doing this? Like, what's the point? When you're creating permanent writing samples regularly, it's going to provide you with a lot of information about choices the student's making most often and maybe which switch sites are the most uh, reliable. And you might pick up information about latency. Maybe if you gave a little more time, you might have a more consistent response. Or you might notice uh, an optimal size or color or placement of the icons or tactile objects. So that's the big takeaway from this presentation. For the purpose of MCAS writing, it's about building expressive communication systems. Writing is not about the motor skill of writing or tracing or keyboarding. MCAS writing is about expressive communication. And so I, I hear some of you might be saying, well, you know, my student doesn't have a, a communication system. Well, that's this process is giving you a little push for you to be able to push your administrators to say, I need to help find a communication system for my kiddo. So as we were talking about, MCAS writing does not assess the physical act of writing or keyboarding or tracing. It's about communicating. Now, you may notice that some of the um, access entry points do include elements of movement. They do include grasping or orienting materials or switch activation. But it's not about the students um, recording their communication exchange. It's just noting that these movement um, pieces are integral components of the students' communication systems. So when you're looking to get some help on this strand, think about going to your SLP, not your OT. And I like to think about it this way. The writing strand is about creating a document that memorializes a communication opportunity and gives us some data on what may be uh, working and what might be resonating with your students. So how do you do this? Let's take a look at some samples. Next slide. So to get started, Kevin showed us the forms and graphs program and um, the submission requirements are the same for entry or access. You're gonna complete the writing skill survey. And next to that, you're gonna find, um, next to find the writing measurable outcome, you go to select a new strand, which is ELA, but then you have to pick writing text types. And the text types represent different expressive communi communication opportunities that we're gonna provide for our students. So let's take a look at or consider those different um, text types. So opinion is one of my personal favorites because opinion is something that I do with my kids all day. So opinion samples can document all those choice-making activities and opportunities that we provide all day long. So an opinion piece, for example, on All About Me, that might consist of documenting the student's personal choices. And one of the things that, you know, I think might be a useful takeaway for you today is that if you're, um, you know, doing a student survey, which is something that, you know, I like to do in the beginning of every school year with what their favorites are and things, you can also use that sample as the student's portfolio introduction and get a twofer. <laughs> Um, the second text type to take a look at is um, uh, inf inf informative. So informative samples are about facts. And so teachers might create templates to record student responses after teaching a lesson to just capture what resonated with the students. Um, but just a note that I want you to consider here, that for access students, if you're creating those tem templates with fill in the blank answers, they're all going to be errorless. And what do I mean for that? Well, we don't want to know whether or not they you know, remember the correct answer from a story that you read. Um, because the data for access kids isn't uh, based on finding the right answer. Um, when the data that we're collecting is on students' participation using their communication strategy. So, er so the choices might be errorless, but we're still taking data on their independence. And that independence score reflects how independently the student addressed the writing measurable outcome of tracking or grasping or releasing or moving materials. So consider that when you're um, creating informative text types. Um, and finally, the narrative text type is about personal experiences. And for example, having, um, you, um, for example, consider having the student participate in writing. And I, if you, if I had my camera on, you'd see me using air quotes with my fingers on that, that daily note home at the end of the day. Um, you know, you're sitting there with a student and you might say, well, dear mom, um, and today I had, and you present 
the PT or the music um, tactile schedule pictures that they use from uh, PT music. And the student can choose which ones he wants to talk about first. And so you write your permanent product and then you scribe it and um, you scribe which object the student picks and uh, to complete the sentence. And then you can keep a copy for the portfolio and you send a copy home with the objects and that communication exchange can, can be repeated over time and space, and that conversation can be replicated at home. So that's also something you can think about in terms of, you know, which kind of text type you want to collect. And remember, you only need a baseline and three samples over the whole year. And, and I'm going to encourage you to um, just have this be a component of your day so that you'll have lots and lots to choose from when it comes time to submit your portfolios. So let's look again. Um, so in the resource guide, um, when you're reviewing the text types and purposes, you're gonna consider which one of these best align with your student's primary mode of communication. Um, and then in the forms and graphs program at the access um, level, unlike the entry level, you have lots of um, uh, access skills that you can choose from to create your measurable outcome. So then you're going to document how the student demonstrates that in that base, baseline writing sample that I told you. And I like to think of that baseline as just an early effort to capture the student's expressive responses that you've identified in the selected measurable outcome. So you can go back and do that, you know, tomorrow. You can just start seeing how it is. And then you just record the student's ability to address that skill in any communication opportunity, noting the independence, then you're going to put um, a rubric with it and the work descriptor label, and that's it. No data charts required. So it's really not a, a difficult thing to do. And as I said, if, if you're doing this over, over time, you're going to be able to collect some really important data that's going to help inform, you know, what progress the student is making in terms of developing a more reliable communication system. So let's take a look at that work descriptor label. Um, so it says it includes a description of what the student was asked to do and how the student participated and contributed to the final program product. And it describes the materials and the context of the activity. And it indicates the student's responses, noting the level of independence to each item or trial using their mode of communication, which was included in, as part of the measurable outcome. And then you have the name, date, independence, and self-evaluation. So let's take a look at a, an example of that. Here's one right here. Um, so the work description label gives additional context. So if somebody's just looking at the work sample, they may not, they may think, well, why is this kid at access level? Because it's this, you know, typed composition. This looks, you know, like it should be at a, a level four entry level. And that's because it's not, the, the teacher didn't make it clear what the student's participation is in it. So this work descriptor label explains that the student's responses available for the student to choose from were presented in an auditory scanning format. And if you were in front of me, I'd have you raise your hand so that I'd see how many of you know what I'm talking about for, by auditory scanning format. But in an auditory scanning format, the errorless choices are presented sequentially and repeated until the student um, indicates what their response is. So after watching, so the measurable outcome is that Carlton will choose from an array of errorless choices within 30 seconds related to the creation of a written product. And that latency is um, added right in there so that you get some reliability across data keepers of how long um, you wait uh, between making each of those um, auditory scanning choices. So Carlton has 30 seconds to make a choice as the choices are scanned. So after watching a video clip, phrases to complete a music review are presented two at a time in an auditory scanning format, which the student activated to make a choice. And then we can talk a little bit about that self-evaluation at a later time. But is this what you're expecting this to look like? So here's Miss Baker's class. And on first glimpse, you're looking at this and you're thinking, wow, you know, the class question is, what did you think of Rachel's song? And Carlton said, the song is great, but there's a P there. Hmm. So um, there's, there's four responses that Carlton made. And uh, in four of them, he was prompted to activate a switch. So that is this is the auditory scanning formats were going round and round. Carlton wasn't making a choice until finally the, the teacher or the helper helped him um, activate his switch to make a response. 
So we can see that he was only 25% independent. And this sample could have also included the uh, auditory scanning uh, format choice that Carlton didn't make. If, if that was inf important information for you to have when you're reviewing these samples, but that's not necessary for the purposes of MCAS. So just keep that in mind as you're taking a look at how to document these permanent written communication exchanges, capture the information that would be the most helpful and useful to you. So taking a look at that um, sample about the music review, how does that score? Here's the rubric that went with the sample. And as Kevin noted, that by selecting an access skill, you're indicating that the student does not yet have a way to express him or herself without having specific, limited teacher-provided vo vo vocabulary. And somebody said, well, that doesn't seem fair that their own, you know, these access kids are only scoring at a level one. But by definition, when you identify that the student's addressing an access skill, it automatically pre-populates to a one score because the text is all being provided by the teacher. And so on this rubric, the only thing that the, te that the teacher has to fill out is the independence percentage. And again, just a reminder that I think it's a good time to think of is that you have a work descriptor label, you have the, the permanent product that you came up with and a um, rubric. It's, it's useful if they're all dated the same, even if they're not completed at the same time. If they're all dated the date of the sample, it makes it clear which um, work descriptor label and which rubric goes with which sample. So consider that. So let's take a look at another one. So in this one, here's an example of a narrative writing sample. And um, the measurable outcome tells how the student participated in the creation of this document. So Ralph is going to orient or manipulate materials related to the creation of a written product. And um, so in this one, the student was given Mayor Johnson pictures related to the field trip at the shelter, and he oriented the Mayor Johnson pictures to illustrate the story. So um, although, again, remember, although this is a motor skill, the materials he's manipulating are his words. And this is his. Um, this is how the student expresses himself. So that's different than somebody who's just, you know, we, we've tried to drill into you. It's not about writing or keyboarding, but it may be the motor skill might um, indicate um, is is allowed if it's part of the student's um, expressive language. So uh, you can see on this slide that there's um, some pluses and some minuses. So um, in each one of these boxes, the student moved the Mayor Johnson pictures to create this sample. Is this what you would expect to see from this, from that work descriptor label? Is this what you were looking to see? Um, you, so you can notice in each response, there's a, a plus or a, an I. And the plus indicates how accurately the student addressed the measurable outcome of orienting the, orienting the, motor, the Mayor Johnson pictures. And the I indicates how independently he did so. So remember, for the purposes of MCAS writing, there's no place for accuracy on the work descriptor label. And although you might choose to note this for your own information, um, in writing, the overall accuracy score is determined by the, um, by the rubric. So let's look at this rubric. Again, you can see that um, uh, once you um, activate it, once you indicate that it's a, um, an access skill, it's all pre-populated. And by definition, that means that everything was created by the teacher. And in access writing, there is no original text. That's, that's what it means. But we do note that the student participated in this activity by moving the communication icons um, at an independence level of 100%. So even though that this was not the student's original thought, we can see that the student was able to do this skill independently. So he's using these Mayor Johnson pictures and, you know, clearly sees the top and the bottom on them. Okay, here's another um, a narrative. Let's take a look at this one. So objects representing the fall were gathered on the playground to be used in the creation of a class poem. The classmates created each line which was written on poster board and the student released the tactile object representing the line into the finish bin as the line was read within 15 seconds. Okay, so and the measurable outcome was that he was going to um, release the objects within 15 seconds. Again, remember that the movement indicates that the materials he's releasing are his communication systems. 
um, symbols. And the classmates are creating each line. So this is an original expressive communication assignment. And one of the things too that you might think of in this narrative is that it's about poetry and poetry is included in the narrative text type. And I think that poetry um, is often a great way for students who are at an access level to participate in expressive communication because it seems that poetry is very sensory and also there's an emphasis on the economy of words, which is um, just right for access kids who benefit from having the focus of limited targeted words. So that's another um, type of a work sample. And again, as noted, even though the teacher on that um, noted whether or not he was, can we go back to that, um, the sample for just a second, Deb? So you can see on this that um, the teacher noted that he didn't re release even with prompting and that he is um, released within 11 seconds and he released within 10 seconds. So that's gonna give you some information going forward of how much latency time you need to build into your communicate, um, communication exchanges. But remember that the overall score is determined by the rubric. So let's take a look at that. So here's the rubric. And again, um, the teacher filled it out that it was access skill, everything pre-populated to one. And then the teacher noted that in four out of five opportunities, he was independent. So four out of five opportunities, he was 80% um, independent. So let's just review this whole thing. So here it is. The, here's the graphic showing the completed writing stand, strand. And remember for access or entry, it's the same submission requirement. You need a skill survey, a work descriptor label with a baseline, no rubrics required for that. But then you need three work descriptor, th three work descript descriptor labels dated with the corresponding three writing samples. And you want them based on three different communication opportunities and with those three rubrics attached. That's it, that's all you have to do, easy peasy. So you saw a few of the examples um, on the work descriptor labels that we showed. And one of them I think showed that the um, student chose whether or not they wanted to uh, review this movie or that movie. Um, and I think that, they, I can't even remember what the other one was, but I want you to think about self-evaluation because self-evaluation at its lowest end is about choice making. And choice making and evaluation of one's own work are the essential components of the concept of self-determination, which is the important predictor of successful post-school outcomes. Self-determination, getting our kids to be independent, that's what it's all about. And so it's not just about, did I do a good job? I mean, teachers of access still students think that it might be impossible for their kids but in fact, self-evaluation is built in the, into the choices that we offer our students all day long. And there's more information in the Educator's Manual on pages 32 and 48 if you want to have some more information about self-evaluation. But let's look at these um, possible choices. They can choose the materials. They can choose the response format, the order of events. They can choose their partner. They can choose to continue or terminate the activity. Um, I want you to just consider all the choices that our kids make and do they want more or are they finished? And I'll give you more information on self-evaluation in the access presentation on the 16th. But the important thing I wanna remind everybody is that I want you to keep it authentic. And I'm frequently asked, what if students don't make choices or don't respond? And I can only say that you wanna consider different choices and just keep trying because that's really what this is all about is being on the lookout for new expressive communication opportunities for our kids. So there's just one more plug before I finish up. This presentation was only about access writing, but if you want additional information on creating portfolio samples for, or other strands or other demands for your students with significant challenges, you might wanna register for the October 16th session that's just on access skills. But I wanna just reassure you that this process is is geared towards enhancing our kids' ability to express themselves. And really, isn't that what this every day is about? Okay, thanks. And Deb, I'm going to just um, turn this back over to you. Thank you so much, Laura. We have um, some of the same contact information that we had in the other one. So if you need to get a hold of us, it is here. Um, 
I think Laura was very clear. We will have this available in, in a week to 10 days if you if you need this information. Um, but again, I totally think if you if this is the type of student you're working with and this is your first year um, doing the alternate assessment, please make sure you sign up for the 16th um, because there's just so much information to try to get into a short amount of time. So we're going to dedicate that time to just talking about access skills. So we thank you. Take care, everyone.